Good morning and welcome. Thanks for joining us for House Calls, Real Docs, Real Talk. I'm your host, Mercedes Fuller, back for more healthy conversation. As you might have noticed, the American Heart Association has made health equity one of its main goals. In past shows, we've discussed equity along racial and gender lines. Today, we're going to look at health equity among the LGBTQ community and specifically how it affects cardiovascular disease rates. Let's get started. With me this morning is Dr. Billy Caceres, Assistant Professor at Columbia University School of Nursing. Dr. Caceres, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's jump into today's discussion with health in the headlines. Each week, we select one current headline that ties back to the topic at hand, and we ask our expert to respond. This week's entry comes to us from NPR, and it's titled, U.S. Will Protect Gay and Transgender People Against Discrimination in Healthcare. Dr. Caceres, that sounds like a good start to me. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it is a good start. I think it's um, very important. There's research to show in the work that we've done through the American Heart Association's scientific statement that was published last year on LGBTQ individuals and their cardiovascular health, there's work that shows that many LGBTQ people avoid seeking health care because they are afraid of being discriminated against by health care providers. So I think any policy that sort of helps reduce or eliminate discrimination in health care for LGBTQ people is good. I think one of the important things to think about this policy is that this is a policy of the administration, and that as we've seen with many LGBTQ policies, depending on the administration that's in office, the policies might change. Um, so, but it is a great policy. It's an extension of prior policies that have been passed by the Supreme Court um, just as recently as last year, the case of Bostick versus Clayton County, which ruled that it's illegal to discriminate against somebody in an employment setting because of sexual orientation or their gender identity. So I think this is a really good step in making many LGBTQ people feel more safe and comfortable in seeking health care. Absolutely. Thank you, doctor. Let's get into our main segment to answer viewer questions in You Ask, We Answer. Dr. Caceres, I see we have a lot of questions waiting for us this morning. Are you ready? I am. Our first question comes to us from Michael in Palm Beach. He asks, what can you tell me about the health of transgender people? So transgender adults or individuals um, are a growing population. So the transgender community is generally, or transgender is generally a term that's used for people whose gender identity currently is not aligned or does not match their gender or their sex assigned at birth. So somebody who might have been born a male but now identifies as a female might be a transgender female or transgender woman. So what we do know is that, and a number of studies have shown this, that transgender individuals generally have worse health outcomes, many of which are associated or lead to worse cardiovascular health, things like poor mental health, higher tobacco use, and higher use of alcohol and other substances. What we what is sort of a bigger question, what we don't know is how the cardiovascular health of transgender people is affected by very unique factors to transgender individuals. So the biggest factor is that usually gets cited is the use of these gender affirming hormones. So oftentimes about 50% or more of transgender individuals might be on hormones to help their gender expression or how they're viewed match their gender identity. So commonly for transgender women, they're generally on feminizing hormones like estrogen. Transgender men might be on testosterone or other masculinizing hormones. And the bigger question in the field for a number of years has been, what is the influence of those hormones on people's cardiovascular health? And it's still sort of an unanswered question, but we're doing more and more work in that area to sort of begin to understand or better understand the influence of hormones on cardiovascular health. Wow. Wow. Eleanor from Denton, Texas asks, are LGBT adults just as healthy as cisgender heterosexual people? 
I think that if we if we look at the health literature, which tends to focus on sort of like deficiencies or deficits, that you would think that LGBTQ people, that the majority of them have a number of different health outcomes. But I think it's important to think about that even within the LGBTQ community, there's different levels of risk for different conditions. And I think it's particularly one of the things that uh, has been shown is that particularly people of color that are also LGBTQ might have or tend to have different health outcomes than white LGBTQ people. So although most of the research is focused sort of on this deficit perspective or things uh, sort of the health problems that might be higher in LGBTQ people, I think it's also important to recognize some of the strengths in the community. And what we do know is that when LGBTQ people feel more supported by family members and their community, that they tend to have better health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Here's one from Cora in Chicago. Why are LGBT adults generally in poorer health than their cisgender heterosexual peers? That's an excellent question. So I think before even discussing that, I think we need to sort of think about, and I think AHA has done a great job of sort of focusing on what are the factors that lead to health disparities. And for a, for a long time, we felt, we thought as a community that the, diff, the reason why we saw racial ethnic disparities was because of biological factors like genetics or genetic predisposition to heart disease or another risk factor for heart disease. But what we do know is that social factors, things like discrimination, the neighborhood that you live in, your um, the availability of resources like wealth or educational resources really are the major drivers of health. And I think it's no different for LGBTQ populations. So when we look at the main drivers of health, things like income, we see that LGBTQ individuals tend to be more likely to live in poverty. But again, it's not all LGBTQ individuals. When we look at the statistics, and we've had more recent data over the last three or four years, it's really shown that lesbian and bisexual women, as well as transgender individuals, are two to three times more likely to live in poverty than heterosexual cisgender people or non-LGBT people. So I think if we look at it from a perspective of how are social factors influencing the cardiovascular health of LGBTQ people, it's sort of easy to follow. And it's not that different than the factors that we know influence the health of other minoritized or marginalized groups. I think the other big thing to think about is that the term that we commonly use is minority stress. So this is stress from being an LGBTQ person that might be greater than the everyday stress that somebody who's not LGBTQ experiences. So for instance, somebody who's LGBTQ, going back to the example about healthcare discrimination, in addition to having work stress and financial stress, they also have to worry about, am I gonna be discriminated against when I go seek healthcare? Or am I gonna be discriminated against by a police officer or another service worker? And it's this added stress that we think is contributing to the worst cardiovascular um, outcomes that we see in the population. So it's really driven by social factors, many of which operate in day-to-day -day interactions that an LGBTQ person might have with other individuals in their community. But we also think about things like policies, so the healthcare discrimination policy. And passing more protective policies, we think, might be a great way to help improve the health of many LGBTQ people. So I think it's a complicated issue, but the crux of it is really about social factors and this increased stress that LGBTQ people experience. So, and I, I think to put it plainly and in simple terms that the way that our society is set up, it is just a little bit harder for some people to navigate their everyday lives than others. And I think for individuals who might be marginalized or mar minoritized like LGBTQ people, I think the health outcomes that we're seeing are a direct result of that marginalization. So much important information and we thank you for bringing clarity to you some of these questions that we have. Lawrence has a question and he wants to know, are there any notable patterns of poor lifestyle behaviors in LGBT men and women? Yes, yeah, so that's really important. And it gets at the point that I made earlier that the health outcomes that we see in the community differ by different identities that people in the community might have. So for instance, there is an extensive body of research that shows that lesbian and bisexual women are much more likely to meet criteria for things like obesity. They're much more likely to smoke. And newer evidence that shows they're more likely to meet criteria 
for having diabetes as well. But when we look at gay and let gay and bisexual men, we see sort of a different pattern. So gay and bisexual men might also also have higher rates of tobacco use, but among bisexual men, some of the more recent evidence shows that they're also more likely to have hypertension or high blood pressure. So that these risks that we see are a little bit different depending on somebody's sex or their gender identity. So thinking about transgender individuals, those who identify as transgender women, we see that they're much more likely to have higher cardiovascular risk compared to the general population, even more so than transgender men, even though both transgender men and women are more likely to smoke. But the evidence that we see where we see higher rates of heart attacks and stroke among transgender people, it's really been among transgender women. And there's a number of reasons for that, or that people think that that occurs. And one of the main reasons is a hormone use. And estrogen and other feminizing hormones being more likely to be associated with higher cardiovascular risk than masculinizing hormones like testosterone. And the other thing that we see is that even among transgender women, that the risk for heart disease, even when they're on estrogen, isn't the same, that we see much higher risk among women who transgender women who are on estrogen and are also currently smoking. So that these risks sort of differ depending on sex, depending on race, and a number of other factors. Here's one from Casey in Gulf Shores. What do we know about the health of LGBTQ teenagers? So the health of LGBTQ teenagers is interesting. Uh, much like most of the literature on LGBTQ health, most of the work that's been done has focused on mental health and substance use, things like tobacco use and alcohol use. We know a lot less about cardiovascular risk factors like obesity and diabetes among LGBTQ youth. But some of the more recent studies, and it's really a handful of studies, seem to indicate that LGBTQ youth are at higher risk for things like diabetes and obesity. So some of the work that we've done at Columbia with one of our PhD students, her name is April Anchetta, she's a nurse. She did an analysis of some existing data the US government collects. And what we found was that bisexual boys and lesbian and bisexual girls had much higher rates of tobacco use, alcohol use, and obesity than heterosexual youth. So we're only beginning to really understand what the cardiovascular health of LGBTQ youth is. But I think what's important and noteworthy to think about when we look at LGBTQ youth is that we see similar patterns of behavior and of risk that we see in cardiovascular health with LGBTQ adults. And what that leads me to sort of think is that potentially some of these patterns of behavior for poor cardiovascular health might actually start develop, they actually start developing early in life. And that it's not just something that happens when you reach adulthood, but they probably start occurring even in early adolescence. I think the other big thing to really think about for LGBTQ youth is that we know when LGBTQ youth are supported by their family members, more so than any other group of people, but family support and family acceptance are the most important drivers of health for LGBTQ youth. Simon from Missouri wonders, what policies are needed to improve the health of LGBTQ people in the United States? That's a very good question. I think that we've seen over the last five or six years, we've seen changes in policies that we know have improved health for many LGBTQ people, right? The passage of same-sex marriage in 2015, this most recent law that was passed last year, which made employment discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity illegal. So now people that are transgender or lesbian, gay, and bisexual don't have to fear potentially being fired for their sexual orientation or gender identity. I think what we often do is we tend to focus on these LGBTQ specific policies. But I think that policies that at first aren't necessarily applicable or aren't, don't seem like they're applicable to LGBTQ people. Um, I think those are the policies that we need to focus on. Think policies that promote income equality. I already just discussed the higher prevalence of poverty among lesbian and bisexual individuals. So those types of policies. We do know that lesbian, bisexual, and transgender women are much more likely to live in, in poverty and that families that are comprised of two women are much more likely to live in poverty than families comprised of two men or a man and a woman. So in terms of thinking about policies, things like paid child leave, policies that decrease the gender gap for wages, those types of policies that you wouldn't necessarily right away think as of as LGBTQ policies, I think it's just as important to promote or advocate 
for the passage of those types of policies that we know will disproportionately advantage the neediest people within the LGBTQ community, bisexual, transgender individuals. We've got just a few questions left. Valerie from upstate New York asked the question, can you talk about the health of LGBT people of color? Yes, and I think the American Heart Association's Association statement that we published covered a bit about this, but the truth is that we don't have much evidence of how the health of LGBTQ people of color might differ from white LGBTQ people and then also non-LGBTQ people. But the small amount of studies that have been conducted on this really seem to indicate that certain groups of LGBTQ individuals that are also people of color tend to have worse outcomes for a number of different factors. So for instance, some of the work that my group and I have done has shown that lesbian women and bisexual men and women, especially those who are black or Lat Latinx or Latino, are much more likely to be at higher risk for hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. And that that is not explained by sort of traditional risk factors that we think about age as being a big risk factor for cardiovascular disease, right, that we can't really change, but also things like tobacco use, that even when we when we really take into account things like tobacco use and age, we still see these differences where LGBT people of color potentially do worse for a number of cardiovascular outcomes. Some of the work that I've been doing lately has really focused on sleep. And we know that sleep is an important factor that contributes to cardiovascular health and overall health. But what we've really found is that when we look at sleep and particularly short sleep duration, which is when somebody sleeps six hours or less per night, which is a big risk factor, heart disease, obesity, cancer, mortality, a number of really bad health outcomes. What we see is that it's LGBT people of color that actually have worse sleep health and that that in itself might place them at higher risk for things like cardiovascular disease. But I think overall, sort of what we know about LGBT people of color will only increase over the next few years because there's a lot of attention to sort of what happens when you're a member of the LGBTQ community, but also a member of another community that also experiences these worse health outcomes? And there's a lot of interest sort of in thinking about how does that influence health and what can we do to better promote the health of these people that might belong to more than one mar minoritized or marginalized group? So much opportunity for the great research that you're doing, doctor. Our last question comes to us from Cody. He wants to know, what are some questions to ask to help find the best healthcare provider if I am LGBTQ? Good question. Yeah, I think that's a, a question that a lot of people think about that are LGBTQ. And there's a number of resources. So the Human Rights Campaign releases a health equity index every year that actually rates different hospitals and health systems around the country based on a number of different metrics that include whether or not they protect their own employees from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity, if they have an LGBTQ health program within the health system. So that's one resource. Also, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association is this interdisciplinary organization that has an, um, a publicly available list of providers that identify, either identify as LGBT or have identified as being capable of providing adequate care to LGBTQ people. So that's a great way, another great way to start. And you can look at that list around the entire country. So it's not just specific to a particular state. I think the other thing and what happens a lot is that people tend to hear, it's word of mouth, and you tend to hear from your friends that are also LGBTQ about different providers that you felt really provided really good care for you, and that might be because you're an LGBTQ person, or might be independent of that, but actually provided care that sort of met you where your needs were at or met you where you were at. So I think those are really the sort of like three big um, avenues that people have to sort of find what we tend to call is LGBT friendly care or LGBT affirming care. Um, but I think what's great now, even more so than five or 10 years ago, is that there's a lot of online resources. So if you can't find resources in your area, that I think going to some a place like the Human Rights Campaign website or the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association might help you find people near your area that you can go to. Wow, so much great information, Dr. Caceres. We thank you for your work that you're doing on this topic. And it's so important that everyone receives the help and attention that they need. Everyone, I am so proud of the American Heart Association's dedication to health equity 
for all. Is there anything else that you would like to add before leaving us today, Dr. Caceres? I think the only thing that I'll say is that for anybody who identifies as an ally of the community or has a family member who's a member of the LGBTQ community, there's a lot that we can do to sort of raise our voices and advocate for more inclusive policies or better health care for LGBTQ people. And organizations like the American Heart Association and many other organizations are doing this type of work. So I encourage people to get involved and make their voices heard. Thank you so much, doctor. That does it for our show today. You can find any of our previous shows at the AHA's House Calls YouTube playlist. Thank you so much for tuning in and asking so many thoughtful questions and happy 4th of July. Have a blast. Did you get that? And don't forget to wear your sunscreen. Take care. The world keeps changing. So my mission is turning challenges into opportunities. I'm opting in, signing up, and using my voice. Today, I recommit to my shine. For myself, for my community, for our health. There is strength in possibility, and new opportunities are coming. With the American Heart Association by my side, I'm ready to thrive. Because I, because we, live fierce. Learn more about House Calls, Real Docs, Real Talk, and submit your questions at heart.org slash housecalls.